All right. So, um, I was about to make a uh, short little video of um, modeling flying squirrel habitat for my students. And I decided instead to break down the whole process into a series of short videos. And I will make these videos available to the public in hopes that uh, they might help someone out there who is trying to generate or create or develop a, a geospatial model of some sort. So I'm going to do a very sort of rudimentary back of the envelope kind of uh, suitability model, an index model uh, in design, uh, but I'll talk about some other things that could be in there. And we will, um, I'll walk you through the steps and show you the products and uh, post videos and this should be helpful for my students and maybe uh, some of you folks out there in the World Wide Web will get some use out of it as well. Okay, so uh, I want to talk about how to build a basic suitability model. And so um, I'll, I'll sort of discuss the steps in some of these things and we'll talk a little bit about how I do it and how you can do it in a simple and easy fashion. So the first thing I always feel like you have to do is you have to develop a question and then you have to design an answer. And what I mean by that is um, when you're developing a model or structuring a model, what you're really doing is looking at ways to geospatially combine information um, to answer questions, solve problems, or expose trends or relationships um, that we suspect might exist, but we can't uh, necessarily prove outside of a, a GIS. And that's sort of where the designing an answer comes in. Um, we have a problem or a question, and we have to think about how we can spatially combine things that will give us an output that answers that question. And so that it eliminates um, blatant and obvious interpretation, uh, and it just it's there. It's as plain as day. It's as obvious as a flashing red light in the dark. And so if we're going to do that, we have to acquire some data, format your workspace and fix your projections, standardize and weigh your components, and then do some basic map algebra, and then generate knowledge or, you know, this uh, answer, if you will. So this is kind of those four big steps uh, that I think goes into building a suitability model. And so that's what I'm going to do and so for video one this video we're just going to address that first line that developing a question and designing an answer so how does one go about uh, the aspect of developing a question well if you're going to develop a question and design an answer you have to have a topic and so before we can develop something we have to know what we're going to work on And I think what we'll look at here today is habitat suitability model. I think this is the most basic kind of model. It is highly adaptable, highly um, utilitarian. You can use it to do a lot of different things. You can apply the techniques in a lot of other areas. Uh, and as is often the case, we're going to mix elements and components of different styles and things. Um, I don't believe there's any super meritous uh, rationale behind um, developing a very pure stylistic type of model for one way or the other. What matters is that you can combine things logically uh, in a sensible fashion to answer questions. And so whether we're using a, a Boolean model with ones and zeros, yeses and nos, trues and falses, or a pure index model, uh, where we've ranked a bunch of stuff and we're combining it in such a fashion to get a, uh, an index value that allows us to rank one location to another. Or some sort of a process model that um, 
you know, utilizes a lot of known relationships, things like topographic wetness indices and stuff like that, or whether we're going to um, utilize statistics to identify uh, variables that correlate strongly to specific outcomes and then generate some sort of regression equations that we can then mathematically and geospatially apply to our data to uh, map out these complex relationships. But for me, I think all models have a few basic things in common, and that's what we're going to focus on. Models combine information to generate knowledge that's not easily gained outside of a GIS. That is the purpose of a model. It does the thing that you can't do without GIS. It takes spatial information and generates a spatial answer. I think most models uh, inform a managerial decision. It is a means of assisting with a decision. Models are not always the answer. Models are often the most um, uh, unopinionated answer. It's not necessarily the best answer. The best answers are often ones that have a social, economic, and political component that is not part of the model. Uh, many of those aspects could be modeled, but oftentimes um, I, I think uh, we model things out so that others can use that modeled output as a, a means of um, assisting with difficult decisions. I also think models are, are designed around a question or a relationship. You're either creating a model to answer a question or to understand some interaction. That, that's just me. Uh, there are obviously probably some scenarios out there that don't fit into my neat little uh, one and zero kind of world. But uh, I think more often than not, when we look at geospatial models, um, it's either to answer a question or to understand something. And so models answer questions or manifest ideas. They are physical expressions of concepts and data. Um, they point you in a direction. They help you figure out where the next Burger King should be built, where the flying squirrel should live, where you want your bunker, where not to go in a zombie apocalypse, um, which hospitals need extra personal protective equipment during a pandemic. Uh, there's all sorts of clever ways that simple basic modeling can be applied to solve spatial problems. And lastly, good models make informed decisions or express some options um, or choices in a clear or at least a cleaner or clearer way than simply choosing. The idea of a model is to um, not necessarily make it uh, uh, you have to do this, but to provide some idea of this is better than that. And then lastly, models are based in facts, not opinions. Uh, opinions are for politicians, administrators, and officials. Um, in the geospatial world, um, we deal with more or less absolutes and by absolutes I mean we take a fact or an equation or an idea and we create a physical manifestation of that um, now it doesn't mean it's right doesn't mean it's always true but it it is based on something some tangible thing there's a math there's an equation there's something that went into it that's not just well I kind of like it over there better uh, that's not what we do. Okay, so if we were to get started, we are going to look at um, a habitat suitability model, and we're going to look at some uh, a, an animal that historically was um, highly threatened, um, endangered even, that has made a pretty profound recovery, and... Um, had some legal cases about it to get it off the list, and it is not this bear. The 
animal we're looking at is found here in mostly in West Virginia and in a couple counties in Virginia. And it is a type of flying squirrel. This is not a picture of the specific one we're looking at, uh, but this is a flying squirrel in general, and so it's going to be something like this. Basically, it's a cross between one of those uh, um, uh, gliding suits that people jump, that parachuters wear to fly around, and a squirrel. In other words, it has a uh, profoundly obvious looking skin flap that runs from its wrist to its ankles so that when it extends, it can glide greater distances and basically falls under control uh, and allows it to go from tree to tree. And in order to create a model about something like this, you've got to have some information uh, as a source of how we're going to model it. So um, I've got a nice little PDF here. It's a habitat model for the Virginia Northern Flying Squirrel in the Central Appalachian Mountains. Uh, this is very similar to the West Virginia uh, Flying Squirrel. Uh, in class, I use a really simple model that I've sort of come up with over the years uh, from a old Forest Service PDF, not this one, but a different one. And basically in it, it says 900 meters in elevation in certain tree types. Um, we're going to use some of the harder numbers out of this um, particular document because uh, these numbers will give us um, some additional information that we don't that we didn't wouldn't have with the other um, publications that allow us to create a more interesting model and so this one shows that uh, uh, forest types dominated by either red or Norway spruce and northern hardwoods uh, with a considerable spruce component greater than 50% um, are selected preferentially over northern hardwoods or mixed uh, mesophytic forest and so um, we're going to take that approach and rank um, certain forest types from our land cover data set in terms of how we like or dislike them um, this paper also indicated that the best elevation that they found based on where they found these nests or how they tracked them or they were doing was at 1036 meters but they had identified squirrels as low as 700 and up to somewhere in the 1400s and so um we're going to consider that as well and so that kind of gets us down to our question how much west virginia northern flying squirrel habitat exists in west virginia and so we need to identify this habitat in this area and just see how much is there. Now, we're going to create a little bit more simple model than what this paper used. This paper had aspect and a bunch of other things that they looked at. They did some complex regression stuff and eventually worked their way back to two terms and then used the regression equations to generate a model. We're not going to do that. We're going to stick with a really more simplistic approach, but we're going to use some of their numbers. We're only going to use two terms, uh, and that being land cover and elevation. So we'll select specific land cover elements, and we'll select specific uh, elevation ranges. And then we will rank and standardize our land cover um, based on what they like best uh, from the paper. Uh, we'll figure out a scoring metric for that. Uh, we're going to create sort of a fuzzy set uh, of elevation. Uh, they found squirrels as low as 700. The best appeared to be at 1036, and so we'll go from 7 to 1036, increasing from 0 up to 100. And then at 1036, we'll go from 100 back to 0 at whatever the highest elevation is. Now, uh, in theory, this would also be a good spot to do a 1-0 kind of thing. Uh, in class, a lot of my students use this number, 9 or 909, and they will look at um, uh, sort of a 1-0 boiling kind of a layer where they all go, uh, everything that's less than 900 gets a value of 0, and everything that's greater than uh, 900 gets a value of 1. I will, in a later video, uh, I'll show you how to create both of these types of layers and we will um, look at how that affects the modeling output 
And so I'll take um, all that stuff we've come up with, and I'll create a model. I'll generate an index model and, and a map of ranked habitat cat categorized into good, better, and best habitat. But more importantly, I'll be able to numerically quantify the area of that habitat, and from that I can... Answer that basic question. How much flying squirrel habitat exists in West Virginia?